I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Be water, my friend. Hello, Flow Grader, and welcome to another episode of The Flow Grade Show, your podcast on everything biohacking. This week's episode is about accelerated learning, memory and speed reading, skills that we would all like to excel at and to improve upon. My guest today is Jonathan Levy, and he can really coach you to get better, to read quicker, to learn faster, and to memorize more. He's a rock star podcaster with his Becoming Superhuman podcast, and he has coached thousands of people all around the world to improve upon these elements and extract more knowledge in less time. This is a very cool episode where you can really learn how to become more productive in your daily life. So now enjoy this episode with the fantastic Jonathan Levy. Jonathan, great to have you on the show. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure, my pleasure, Max. Good to see you again. Same here, same here. And uh, this episode is going to be about learning and learning fast and speed reading and memory because you are in the scene. You're, first of all, a fantastic podcaster and I follow you. Thank and, you. Thank you. Uh, you're an inspiration. And uh, however, what I really would like to tap into because I think that's sort of your superpower in the area <laughs> is you are a great, first of all, coach on teaching how to learn fast, how to double or triple your, your reading speed. And I think you were quite known for that at your MBA school at INSEAD as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I certainly garnered a little bit of attention, especially from my group mates, uh, you know, with the speed reading skill when we'd be assigned a case study and I would finish before everyone else. It kind of raises red flags. People start to ask, uh, you know, are you, are you going to do the reading or have you done the reading? So, yeah. <laughs> so how did that all start? I mean, how did you get the idea of, of speeding up your reading and learning faster and memorizing more? How did that all start? Well, it goes way back, Max. Actually, when I was a kid, I took an interest in reading, but I struggled a lot as a student uh, in my younger years. And I remember, I think I was about eight, maybe 10 years old. My mother got me a book, Evelyn Wood, Seven Day Speed Reading Program. Uh, and I tried it out and didn't really work for me. So, but I had this idea of speed reading in my mind. Maybe about five, six years later, maybe even more, I encountered Tim Ferriss's book. He has a little bit on speed reading on his blog. Mm. You know, still couldn't get it to work. I was reading fast, relatively 450 words a minute or so, but my comprehension was really low. So I had chalked speed reading up to just a bunch of BS, you know, snake oil. And then uh, after I sold my first business, I was working in a venture capital uh, firm here in Israel, actually. I'd come, I was going to do a few months uh, working as an EIR, entrepreneur in residence. And I actually met someone who was working in one of the startups incubated at the VC office. And this guy could Basically, he'd, he'd come in every morning. He knew a little bit of our common interests, things that we both found uh, appealing to read about. And he'd come in at nine in the morning. He'd sip his coffee for 10 minutes and he'd send me 10 blog posts. I started to wonder, what the heck's going on? Like, why wow. is he doing this? And and I confronted him about it and said, hey, what what's the deal? You know, <laughs> and I realized I came to learn that he was reading at about 2000 words a minute with 90 percent comprehension. Uh, wow. needless to say, I, I inquired more. I still remember exactly where I was sitting and and we sat over lunch that day and he told me all about his wife and how she'd done this very extensive certification program, how they together had improved and developed all these methods for memory, speed reading and accelerating learning. So needless to say, as, as someone who had wanted to learn about this, I went ahead and hired her as a private tutor. His wife's name was Anna. The gentleman himself was called Lev. Mm -hmm. And we worked together. We only had about six weeks because I was going away to my MBA. And I knew that I had a, a mountain of reading, 1,100 pages of reading to be done before the program even started. And I had struggled to accomplish all the reading in my undergrad. So I could only imagine, you know, INSEAD being a 10 month condensed MBA, I was stressed. I knew there was going to be a lot of socializing. So we had six weeks. And in that six weeks, she trained me to do things that I didn't really think were possible prior to that. 
And when I went off to the NBA, I saw just how effective the skills are. I mean, I could read. I don't know how many people did all the reading in the MBA program, but I certainly did. Uh, I could wow. read much, much faster. I could retain information much, much better. Unfortunately for me, an MBA is very little about memory. So, you know, I could memorize the, the definitions of things, but in, in practicality, your performance in school has not as much to do in that case with memory and much more to do with case studies and applied learning and stuff like that. So later on, I would kind of use these techniques to research more about neuroscience, research more about the science of speed reading, the science of memory, and eventually build an online course. And that's the course that you probably know me from, Become a Super Learner. The Udemy course. Yeah, it started as a Udemy course. Today, we offer our own platform. We have a premium masterclass uh, on our own website, stuff like that, mastermind. So we've really built a full brand and a full movement out of the success that we, we were fortunate enough to have on Udemy. So what's your reading count right now? Where, where's per minute? You know what's ironic about it is I, as a speed reader, am not that fast. Uh, I have students who are much faster than me. Okay. I average about 700 words a minute. The fastest I've ever gotten to when I was in my MBA was 800 words a minute. Uh, an average reader, college-educated reader, will go at about 250 words a minute. So, but it, I mean, sometimes if I'm reading something really dense or, or kind of difficult to slog through or something that I want to take a little bit slower, I'll even read at 500 words a minute. But my comprehension and retention is in the 80, 90% range, depending on what I'm reading. So, and, and your average person has 60 to 70% comprehension. So wow. twice as fast, two to three times as fast and two to three times, well, one and a half to two times retention. Uh, before going a little more into the detail of the methodology, I, I also tried to speed up my reading a while ago and I had no idea you know, about anyone mm. teaching that. So I, I found this program called Rocket Reader, I think it was okay. called. And I tried it and I noticed, yeah, I, I, I could get my reading speed up, I think to about 600 or something like that, if I remember right. Great. But then I would, I would go down almost immediately after stopping to practice. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I liken it to the analogy of sitting up straight. Uh, you've been told all your life, sit up straight, it's better for your back. And yet, there we go, exactly that. So every time you sit down, you need to remind yourself, uh, well, what's the right habit here? You know, we've been told all our lives, don't hit the snooze button, get up, early bird gets the worm. Habits are hard to break. You know, habits are super hard to break. And so even still, I've been speed reading now four or five years. When I sit down with a book, the first inclination is to read one word at a time, slowly it. sounding it out in my head. Exactly. Yeah. And then I go, wait, wait a second, I'm a speed reader. Okay, boom, 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 boom. But then if something stops me in the middle of my flow, like say I, I want to take a note or say I want to, uh, you know, answer a text message, I have to go back and remind myself. So it, I don't know if it ever becomes second nature. It is, it is work, you know, just like sitting up straight. So, wow. And uh, how many books do you read right now? I read a book a week, although this week I'm behind. I've got three days to start and finish my next book, but usually that's, that's enough. It takes me between two and six hours to read your average book. And so. How much do you read in one sitting or how, how much time do you spend in one sitting? Let's say. Uh, it's so variable. I, I'm working on habit design in other areas of my life. So a lot of times what I'll do when I get bored with a daily work I'll, instead of going to Facebook for 10 minutes, I'll try and pick up my Kindle for 10 minutes. Other times, I mean, this week I'm behind and I, I'm really big about setting goals and accomplishing them. So this week, at some point, I need to read an entire book. I plan on being at, uh, at a wedding for the whole weekend. So probably what I'll do is get home Saturday night, sit for three hours straight and just power through a book in one sitting. Uh, so it's highly variable, but on average, my reading sessions are 20 to 30 minutes. Ah, okay, so you're actually doing that because I listened to some of your podcasts and in one, I think you said, I'm going to read your book right after this, actually literally right after this recording. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, sure he is. <laughs> He's not going to read it. Depends which one. Some of them I do. Some of them, uh, some of them I don't make it to because I have this long list of like 52 books that I'm supposed to read. Oh, wow. So, okay, but anyways, yeah. now I believe you that you actually do <laughs> And uh Yeah, I think it's, it's just a fascinating skill because, first of all, it, it allows you to extract knowledge. And now you have actually two superpowers because you extract knowledge through reading, by reading mm. books, and then you have the podcast where you interview 
really interesting people. And by the way, all the listeners, I mean, I put the link to Jonathan's podcast in, in the show notes. It's the Becoming Superhuman podcast. It's an amazing uh, Thank you. piece Thank of work. Thank you so much, Max. And uh, can only recommend to check that out. But now maybe go in a little into more practical advice for anyone listening yeah. right now. So let's say they have a page in front of them. What, as a speed reading coach, what is the first thing that someone can do in order to practice speeding up? Mm, okay. Well, I will say this, and then we can go into memory as well. Speed reading is the hard part of the course in an interesting way, because actually what we teach is 60% memory in the actual lectures. But at the end of that 60% of lecturing about memory, I can turn you into a memory whiz. And I can tell you the steps you need to take to become a memory grandmaster. Uh, with the speed reading, I lecture about it 40% of the time, but it's 80% of the work because it's breaking this really, really bad habit. Think of it as like uh, trying to learn to walk on your hands. Like I'll tell you what to do and I'll explain to you like straighten your spine, protract your scapula, stand like this, spine not too bent. Cool. Done. But now you'll spend the next three months getting to the point where you can stand for two minutes on your hands. Similar, similar principle. You're fighting against years and years and years of reading slowly. So I'll tell you the basic principles. They are uh, using the full focal eye span, which is called a fixation. So instead of making little saccades or rapid movements of the eye, you have to realize that your eyes are functionally blind while you're moving. It's called saccadic masking. Mm -hmm. uh, your eyes stitch the images together while they're in motion so you don't have blackouts. But oh, wow. at that moment, you're not taking in new information. So what we do when we speed read is we minimize the amount of motion. I look at the page and I move my eyes twice per line instead of eight to ten times. So that right there alone, and I'm taking in three to four words at once. Because if you think about it, the letter B is a symbol to your brain that says B. Uh, and likewise, the letter the quick brown or brown fox jumps is also a symbol, a more complex symbol with more detail. But you can actually learn your teacher brain. You can learn your brain. I have language bleed here. You can actually teach your brain to recognize, you know, the symbol black glasses as one symbol. Uh, and so you're doing that. And then to really accelerate to get beyond the 300 words per minute or something like that, uh, you're learning to try and suppress the subvocalization. So when you look at a picture of a loved one, you don't immediately think, oh, there's Sarah, my beloved cousin. You just immediately get to the understanding. It's rapid. It's, it's instantaneous almost. Your brain can recognize an image in 13 milliseconds. It's oh. crazy. It's super crazy. So, you know, when people tell me like speed reading is a myth, I'm like, it's really not. It's if you think about written text, right? Oh, here, I have a wonderful prop that I can give you. This is just written text, right? It's a picture. It's a symbol. Mm -hmm. uh, and for those who are listening to the audio version, it's just a sign that says 830. Uh, all you're doing, and that's, that's so much less complicated than showing you an actual picture, a photograph, if you will. All you're doing is learning to translate that to meaning in the brain right away. And, you know, there's research. People like to say, well, we're vocal creatures and vocal language evolved before written language and that is true like we only came up with writing systems a few thousand years ago we we evolved over two and a half million years but the fact of the matter is visual data processing is millions of years old right and, and our ability to say there is an apple tree i see bright green ripe apples way predates even our our auditory processing way before we had language uh we had this visual understanding there's a, another tribesman from another tribe with a spear coming at me, right? That's make or break. And the same applies, I'll, I'll kind of segue myself, if you will. Mm -hmm. The same applies to memory. Visual memory way, way supersedes auditory memory. Because if you think about auditory memory, sure, it's important to remember what the lion's roar sounds like. But the more evolutionary advantageous kind of skill is remembering where things were, where you buried your winter food supply, mm -hmm. where the food supply was, where the water supply was, how to get home, so location. And then above that, what, what foods are okay to eat? What do people's faces look who are friends and foes? Uh, which berries are poisonous? Which ones are not? So these are deeply ingrained in our evolutionary psychology. 
Uh, and basically all I teach people is how to, har- how to go back to that, how to harness that, how to, how to use your memory the way that your ancestors did. Wow. This is super interesting. And by the way, uh, I have one question about these 13 milliseconds. So Mm. does that relate to images or symbols that you already are aware of? Or for example, let's say you put together a string of words that would come up with a symbol that you haven't really thought about or seen before. Mm, mm, that's a good question. So uh, I don't know the actual numbers for recognizing uh, that. That's a statistic that they did where they basically flashed uh, really weird. In order to test that, what you have to do is hook someone up to a uh, fMRI machine. I believe it's an fMRI. It might be a PET scan. Mm-hmm. But you ha- because by the time they communicate or raise their hand and send the electrical signal, I mean, that <laughs> your data is screwed. So what they do is they hook people's brain up and they flash an image. And when they recognize, now I don't actually remember if that was recognizing a familiar image, but you can actually Google like how fast does the human brain recognize a familiar face? And that's also fractions of a second. I, I think it might be... 500 milliseconds or something like that. Don't quote me on that. But in fractions of a second, you can recognize a familiar face also for the same reason. So it, it's variances, absolutely. But um, I can show you an image for, for one second and you'll remember it and you'll recognize it and you'll identify different themes, colors, structures, patterns, and even emotions in that one second. Wow. So now my next question would be, because we are actually doing audio work, the two of us have a podcast. Mm -hmm. So is it more beneficial for someone to actually look at, let's say, a documentary or read a book rather than listening to it? Because audiobooks are so popular right now. But Totally, totally. So I will say this. uh, At the end of the day, what needs to happen, the, the visual aspect that I'm talking about in terms of memory doesn't matter if you get the input v- via auditory or visual, because at the end of the day, the words are symbols. What we're teaching is people to actually convert them into pictures, like photographic pictures. So, you know, I read, what's a book that I read recently? Uh, Charles Duhigg, Power of Habit. He talks about this guy who, I won't spoil the book, but this guy who basically uh, lost his memory and somehow, in some weird way, was still able to develop new habits, even though he had no memory, no recollection of going into the kitchen every morning and drinking a cup of coffee. So when I read about that and how I remember that is, I don't remember the story, I remember the visual image. I can tell you exactly what color the cabinets were, where the kitchen was when he walks in. I have a picture of the guy's, uh, how the guy might look, and, and I'm actually imagining. So that's how I'm remembering. So when it comes to audiobooks, if you're sitting there and you're listening and you're doing that process, we call it marker creation and marker linking. Marco creation. Marker, marker, as oh, in marker. Uh, like a marker. Okay, yeah. Marker you might have. Um, so if you're doing that, then that's fine. I will say, though, that our processing capacity for audio for spoken word i mean if people are listening right now i'm speaking pretty quick probably around 170 180 words per minute Mm -hmm. if someone's listening to this at 2x speed they're approaching almost 400 words a minute probably about 360 i would guess they're approaching the limit of of their auditory understanding whereas like i said speed reading starts at 450 so it, it is a matter of time i will say and i do say to my students you know, if it's the choice between listening to an audiobook on the way to work or not reading and consuming new information, choose the audiobook. All right. Obviously, always, or choose the podcast. Uh, you know, always be consuming, always be creating new nodes, new neurons to link to your existing knowledge and build out your knowledge network. Uh, but pound for pound, if it's the difference between sitting on your couch and listening to an audiobook, so I guess that's the thing is audiobooks allow you to be riding your bike you know, or be running at the gym and still consume a book. And I think that's wonderful. Yeah, I think what for me is a a big difference maker oftentimes, which I notice, and I really should get to read more. I read a lot uh, for my blog, you know, to to do research, Mm. but I skip Mm. read. And I don't think it's sometimes so beneficial because I'm looking for specific things. But Mm -hmm. then what happens when I'm, let's say, lying in bed after a long day and I'm a little exhausted and then I either watch or I listen to something because it's pushed towards me and I don't have to do any effort in order to consume it. Mm. But reading uh, pretty much requires that I actively 
do work in order to put these words into my brain. That is true. I will say though, learning is not a spectator sport. Uh, and, and if you don't have to work for the learning, I, you know, who told me this was, uh, Peter C. Brown on my show. Uh, he wrote a book called make it stick. And he says, I love this quote. If learning comes easily, it, it goes easily. Right. Mm. In the sense that if, if you don't work to attain your knowledge, then you likely won't retain it. So I don't know. I retain a lot of knowledge from podcasts, but I think that's also because I apply my learning, right? I'll listen to a show like yours and I'll learn about five great ways to enhance my endocrine system. And then I will go home and I'll apply it and I'll tell people about it. That's another thing. Something taught is something twice learned, which is why podcasting is so wonderful, you know? Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. And me as an athlete, you know, I used to play basketball professionally too. And there's one saying, it sounds cheesy, but it's uh, whatever is worth having doesn't come easy. But it, there's so just true. a lot of truth to that. And I think it's it so true. applies to learning as well. Wow. Uh, so now other than, let's say, reading and uh, podcasting, where can you apply the skill of memorizing a lot? Where do you oh, yeah. personally apply it? The biggest, biggest one, and I love this one, is I go to a lot of like conferences, uh, networking events, things like that. And it's there's always that awkward, you know, you've paid good money or invested good time, taken time away from work to be in this room of these fantastic, inspiring people. Uh, and you don't remember their names after talking to them for 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So I set a goal, you know, recently I joined an organization called Thousand Network, it used to be called Sandbox, now it's called Thousand Network. And we had our first meeting and there were 28 people, 28 members. And I went around the room, introduced myself to everyone else as everyone was doing. Um, and I remembered everyone's name. And I still remember everyone's name, except the one person who I didn't manage to introduce myself to. And that's super useful. I see these people on the street, I see them at the next event and I remember their name, I remember their biography. Um, I've done it at conferences, super useful. You don't want to be writing down people's names or pulling out business cards. You just want to remember so you can go home and look them up, send them an email. Um, that's the biggest one. Most of us today don't need to memorize our credit card numbers and stuff like that. Although it is, it is a lot easier with the techniques that we teach. Um, and yeah, memorizing, like I said, knowledge as well. So learning new things, statistics that I find handy and useful are also nice. Like being able to say 13 milliseconds and know that that is exactly the figure that I read in the study wow. is also useful. Do, do you have a process? And I know you recorded with David Allen, the, the mm -hmm. author of GTD, the getting yeah. things done framework and the book. Yeah. And, uh, do you have a system where you collect information and then organize it? What is your personal way of doing that? Well, I've got the, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and I, I organize a lot of information there. Truthfully told, maybe like 10% of what's happening in my brain is, is uh, recorded in either Evernote or Asana, mm -hmm. depending on what I'm using for. A lot of stuff is in Google Drive, but... Uh, if I think about like where I've put out all my knowledge, a lot of it is in Evernote, to be fair, because I do summarize every book I read and I highlight everything that I find interesting. So a lot of it is in Asana. Uh, and a lot of it, I guess, is recorded into the podcast that I do. But I don't have one comprehensive system besides just my brain. <laughs> I, I can't help but look at the blackboard behind you. I don't know if you filled that out, but for the people I listening, did, yeah. there is a yeah, blackboard is, with a lot of checkboxes and I think about half right. of them are, is checked off. I can't really read it. You, but. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a life dashboard. I recently built a course with one of my mentors uh, on creating a meaningful life and how to build the life of your dreams, how to establish goals for yourself. Uh, because a lot of people kind of think that like, successful or happy people, wh whichever, I tend to think they're the same, but uh, they tend to think that like we just have energy and it just happens, right? If I can count myself among those people. And the truth is, it's not, that's not the case. Like I have goals. I have a strategy session with myself. I treat myself like I would treat an employee. Like, okay, here's what I'm expecting from you in the next fiscal quarter. I want you to spend at least 72 hours a month in nature. I want you to go on at least three dates. You need to do, you know, and I, I set goals for myself. And so this was a little tool that I kind of, uh, invented by taking a lot of other tools that other people use and you can't see but there's like diagrams and charts here i'm a little reluctant to show it because it's deeply personal but um 
Yeah, this is this is how I chart out my life. (laughs) That's good. That's good. Sometimes it's it's uh, also more intriguing to keep some secrets. (laughs) But awesome. Uh, And winding down, you know this this episode because I know you have to run as well at some point, but. Uh, Gotta spend my time in nature, man. Seventy-two hours a month. It's oh, a lot. <laughs> yeah. No. Awesome. And, and yeah, you're pretty much uh, what what I call a biohacker as well. You know, you're part of the mm-hmm. biohacking community, and you've already, I think, hacked many of of the aspects in your life. But if you could name one thing that you haven't hacked yet, let's say from, it could be anything from sleep, nutrition, fitness, dating, productivity. Yeah. I haven't successfully hacked. I've tried to hack. I haven't successfully hacked the dating and, uh, life partner aspects. And I'm in the process. I've read like, I'll get a little personal with you, Max. I've read, uh, like three books so far this year. So I've read 17 books since January 1st, uh, which means I'm one behind As I said, as you can see on my board, I'm one behind. Uh, I've read three different books on like se- human sexuality, human relationships, uh, gender roles, gender differences in the last like two months. And uh, it's a process that I'm working on hacking, but it's, it's really broken from a societal level uh, is what I've come to realize in the same way that we don't use our brains and our bodies the way that we should in the classroom. We don't use our brains, our hearts and our bodies the way that we should in uh in our human relationships, like we're, we're tribal creatures. I don't want to get too controversial, but we're meant to exist in tribes, not in pairs. And we're meant to have better support systems than I think we do. Uh, which means that a lot of relationships have a little bit too much pressure on them and can be very unhealthy when your entire support system goes from a tribe of 50 to your husband or wife. Right. Uh, that's hard and that's unhealthy. And we have not evolved to compensate with that. Uh, so I'm working on hacking that, but I have not, it's hard, man. It's hard. It it's a big tough. decision. Like, uh, I, I have two major big decisions right now. I'm trying to buy another apartment and I'm trying to find a life partner and I'm very good at making small decisions, but big decisions are, are very challenging. Oh yeah. It's very huge. challenging. It's huge. By the way, I mean, I'm, and you know, my, my brand is called flow grade and I'm very interested in that whole concept of flow and uh, i recently mm. talked to jamie wheel the founder of the flow genome project and he has a really interesting take on why it, it's so hard nowadays to uh yeah well find a life partner also develop successful relationships because we're just right. over flooded with stimuli you know we created this environment where uh, we as individuals we we can't thrive anymore right because it's just How too would, much yeah and exactly it, uh, or ask you a question I was just going to say, how was Jamie as a guest? Because I met uh, Stephen Kotler uh, from Rise of the Superhuman at uh, Summit, and he was talking a lot about Jamie and about the Flow Genome Project. I've been meaning to research it. Actually, um, we were just in the process of organizing the recording. Uh, we haven't oh, recorded cool. yet. I met him once uh, in person at the conference, cool. and Jamie's great. I mean, he's super charismatic, really mm. easygoing, open. And uh, he was running around barefoot, I remember, just super chill, easy guy. Awesome. Uh, very cool. Awesome. And uh, no, then Stephen and, and, and Jamie, the two of them, I think they do great work in that, that yeah. field. Yeah. And uh, that's fantastic. But uh, Jonathan, I think for this episode, the listeners already have so much that they can take away now. I'm super I'm excited so to listen it to it again, actually, and write up some, some of the stuff uh, for myself. Mm. Uh, But now, if you could say one thing that you want my audience to remember that they say, yeah, listen to that. So I want to give them two practical takeaways because we talked about memory and I don't want people to feel like, oh, my God, there's this world of people. I I mean, there are people out there who memorize 30,000 digits. There are people out there who can remember 34 decks of cards in an hour back to back. Right. And those things are possible and anyone can do them. And I've spoken to many grandmasters of memory who can do these things. Anyone can do this stuff. You listening at home, you can learn to do this stuff. I don't know if you want to, but uh, there are two things you need to know when it comes to dramatically enhancing your memory. One is to turn memories into visual symbols, right? So uh, 
I meet Max, I connect Max to a visual symbol of someone else I know named Max. Or maybe if I want to remember Max and what he does, I think about him as maximizing. So I picture Max having a, a little chart and a little graph that shows he's maximizing human potential. Max the maximizer. Now I create a visual symbol for that. Now the next thing I do, the second core element of memory, is connect everything to pre-existing knowledge. Our brains are extremely efficient, despite the fact that they consume a disproportionate amount of our body's energy. They're 2% of our body's weight. They consume 20% of the resources of the body, which means they need to be hyper-efficient or they would consume even more. Uh, which means, next corollary, they're very, very good at forgetting. So how do you trick your brain into not forgetting things that you want it to remember? You connect it to pre-existing knowledge. And you tell the brain, this is relevant because Max relates to my other friend, Max. Or Max relates to this topic that I'm so interested in called biohacking and maximization of human potential. So with those two core elements, I don't even have to tell you about the hardcore mnemonic devices that we use. I don't even have to tell you about things like memory palaces and and uh, major methods and PAO systems and all this crazy stuff that you can do. Mm. With those two things, if you remember those two fundamentals for the rest of your life, you'll have a better memory than 90% of people. Wow. Uh, so I, I hope people would remember those two fundamentals. And the way that they can do that is they can create a visual symbol and connect it to pre-existing knowledge they have about memory or the brain. That's fantastic. Jonathan, this is powerful advice. And I think everyone listening will really appreciate that. Cool. Thanks so much for doing this. A pleasure, a pleasure. And if anyone wants to uh, check out, we do offer a free trial of our courses. Obviously, check out the podcast. That's free. That's my way of giving back. But if people want to check out a free trial, learn some memory stuff, I think they get like a week free or something like that. They can just go to becomeasuperlearner.com and check it out and uh, all that 30-day money-back guarantee and stuff. So if we don't improve your memory... Fantastic. And uh, now they uh, will show you show to them visually so that remember awesome. better. But now you Perfect. can name your, your domain again. What is your URL? Yes. Uh, so we have become a super And uh, honestly, if you just send them to my website, jle.vi, hmm. it has links to all my podcasts, all my other online courses. Everything that I do is there and you can check out. You can even get like 10 free chapters of my book and and get moving and get going and start uh, start biohacking your brain a little bit. Yeah, it's one of the nicest, I think, bio, biographical websites that I've seen. Oh, it's thank really you. Well, well done. Thank you, sir. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Flowgrade Show. If you would like to find out more about biohacking and how to optimize yourself, then go to flowgrade.com and find our blog and po other podcast episodes there. Until then, I'll hear you next time.